Well, you asked for it, and here it is. To reiterate, King of the Hill is the best show ever, and there are a myriad of episodes that can be considered classics. I want to go on record saying that this list was much more difficult to put together than the last one, and that I had to be very critical of some of these great episodes in order to determine which ones would make the cut. It wasn't easy, and I may or may not feel differently in due time. Also, I want to note that these episodes are not in any particular order. The order kept changing every week, so I'm just going to say these are all in my top 10, say for probably the last three or so. Let's begin. Number 10. Transnational Amusements presents Peggy's Magic Sex Feet. That's a mouthful of a title. Peggy goes out bowling with the neighbors and is humiliated once again by her exceptionally large feet. She finds out her feet are still growing and in tears meets a woman that puts her in contact with some guy that will make her feel good about them. She is convinced to make short videos doing strange things with her feet, and Hank's friends break the news to him in private oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. that it's not exactly what she thinks it is. He tells Peggy, but is sweet-talked by the filmmaker that he is trying to start a movement to make big feet more attractive. Eventually, Peggy figures out that the website is mostly for people that enjoy degrading behavior, and she is mortified. This episode is a great example of putting mundane characters in a fantastical situation, but still managing to be grounded in reality. Peggy is the type of person that would be easily convinced to do just about anything, especially if they complimented her feet and make her feel like she's making some sort of difference. I will be helping create a better world for men and women. I'd be like Rosa Parks. This website is your bus, Peggy. Ride it to freedom. So nothing is really out of left field here. Even when Hank shows her all the evidence and confronts the filmmaker, he is still able to convince her otherwise, at least for a short time. Props to Peggy, though. When she actually does find out the truth, she refuses to accept a lot of money just to continue to further degrade herself. But the guy didn't have to so callously toss the money to her. Hank trying to unsuccessfully cheer her up doesn't help the situation either. But really, the main reason why this episode is on this list isn't really even for Peggy. It's for Bobby. For this scene right here alone. Can you imagine Peggy Hill that stupid? I can't imagine, Mom. I'm fat. Oh, no. No, honey, you're husky. It says so on your jeans. Mom, I'm fat. But big deal. I don't feel bad about it. You never made me feel bad about it, and just because there are some people in the world who want me to feel bad about it, doesn't mean I have to. So Bobby Hill's fat. Heh. He's also funny, he's nice, he's got a lot of friends, a girlfriend, and if you don't mind, I think I'll go outside right now and squirt her with water. What are you gonna do? Dang it, Bobby. That's the most inspiring thing to ever come out of your mouth and definitely one of the best character moments for him. With an attitude like that, Bobby doesn't need to be dragged down by Peggy's negativity. Instead, he gives her a life lesson that she nor anyone else need to be ashamed about perceived imperfections, a lesson that she takes to heart. My name is Peggy Hill and I will take a size 16 and a half. We don't need to know your name, we just need your shoes. Fine. Sixteen and a half. Right on, Bobby. Right on. Number nine. Bobby Goes Nuts. Connie has a slumber party at her house that quickly turns sour after Con makes everyone go to bed. When Bobby comes over to entertain the girls, the party is unexpectedly crashed by Chain Wasana Song and his gang, and they're ordered to leave. Bobby is beaten up by Chain, and instead of having Hank go fight his dad, he is told to go learn how to defend himself at the YMCA. Only problem is, he signs up for a women's self-defense class, which pretty much only teaches him how to kick people in the nuts. This allows Bobby to start winning fights with this method, much to the ire of Hank. How can you not have this episode make the list? It's just so well put together. Bobby himself never struck me as the type to be a bully, or even mean-spirited. For a kid his age, he is pretty secure with who he is and how he looks and tries his best to make people laugh and feel good. So when he's pushed enough by someone to the point where he fights back, it's pretty cathartic to see him be able to stand up for himself and others. 
Well, unfortunately, Hank intervenes and tells him that hitting below the belt is not acceptable. Uh, Hank, since when did bullies fight fair? I get the logic that Bobby's effectively bringing a gun to a knife fight, cheapening what it means to defend oneself, but since when did bullies care about that? When Hank tries to teach him how to defend himself the quote-unquote correct way, Bobby reverts back to the tactic that's worked for him and kicks his dad as well. You left yourself open, Dad. This results in Bobby getting grounded. Punishment? For what? You told me to go to the Y and learn to defend myself, and I did. You got a good point there, Bobby. Hank sent him to the YMCA to learn how to box, but later on, Hank tries to teach him himself anyway. Why didn't you just do that from the get-go, Hank? I shouldn't be so critical. Though to be fair, Bobby didn't really become a mega jerk until Khan put it in his head that he didn't have to listen to Hank while he was incapacitated. Before that, he mostly was just giving other bullies their just desserts. Then Peggy administers a dose of Bobby's own medicine because it got out of hand. This episode alone has some of the most iconic one-liners ever. That's my purse! I don't know you! You have been kicked in the testicles! She bluffing! Finish her! It's also a pretty good arc contained within the episode for Bobby. He starts off feeling weak, becomes stronger, then becomes corrupted, then learns a bit of humility. Bravo! Number 8 Pigmillion. Luann is forced to leave her job when Peggy quits on her behalf and signs her up for a seminar on how to be an entrepreneur. The speaker, the successful businessman Trip Larson, becomes infatuated with Luann and begins to date her. He slowly starts altering her appearance. Luann eventually moves in with him and gives her new clothes to wear and dyes her hair in her sleep. She soon discovers that she is being made into the image of an old mascot of the company that he was obsessed with. Okay, I know I'm going to catch a lot of flack for this. I'm actually surprised how often this appears on others' worst list. And a lot of you may not agree with my explanation, but here goes. King of the Hill historically has a very dry tone to it. As far as evoking a visceral reaction goes, Koth usually plays it pretty safe. There aren't that many episodes, with exceptions, that make the audience feel genuinely sad or uncomfortable. But this one, no, this one just takes you to another place entirely, and it does it very well. Many episodes explore dark subject matters, but this episode is just dark, and I love it. The writers took a risk to try something new, and I think it pays off well. The slow burn of Tripp being an eccentric businessman turned delusional schizo is done so well, due in no small part of the brilliance of Michael Keaton's voice work. Not so terrific. <laughs> Nothing is exactly the same. Everything has a small flaw or imperfection. Drives me mad. I'll have Blanca bring you up a warm glass of milk, okay? Okay. Finish it all. The J5's hooves are soft as bedroom slippers. Shut up! You immediately sense something is off with this guy, but instead of him being the predictable serial murderer, he's just a guy that wants to recreate an old advertisement with himself as the pig and the two hired people as the company faces. It's so bizarre, but it's grounded well. And for a refreshing change, Peggy is actually right about being uncomfortable with Trip while everyone else is enamored with him. No, it's a gift. From Trip Larson. And it's to you. <laughs> I guess somebody owes Trip an apology. The ending is both tragic and darkly humorous. Oh my god. I can suddenly think clearly. The voices have left my head. What am I doing on a pig costume? Uh oh. Wonder how Peggy and Luann just walked away from this without being questioned. Oh well. Number 7 Beer and Loathing The gang's beloved Alamo beer has suddenly disappeared from the shelves. With no explanation as to why, Peggy decides to call the company hotline, opting for the Spanish option. This somehow lands her a temp job at the call center where she is told that in order to increase Mexican numbers, all shipments were sent there. She reveals this to Hank, who goes on a day trip to Mexico to get the beer. Shortly thereafter, she discovers that the Mexican consumers are consistently having health problems after drinking the beer. El vomito, la diarrhea, la nausea, 
She then finds out that Hank, too, has gotten ill because he drank the beer as well. Okay, I'm sorry I blabbed to the guys, but the beer is already here. There's no sense in pouring it down the drain and back to Mexico. Wow, Hank. So basically, after the company finds out that the beer was tainted, rather than throwing out the bad beer, they sent the entire bad production down to Mexico, blissfully ignoring the fact that Mexico has better beer anyway. Many times when King of the Hill does A and B plots, they're independent of each other. But I love that these two plots directly affect the other. Peggy's story at the brewery leads the guys using that information she gets there for their own benefit. The guys going all the way down to Mexico just to get beer instead of waiting one week is just such a thing they would do. And for betraying Peggy's trust, Hank is punished for it in his own way. I'm savoring it. And going to the bathroom. The two are not related. <sighs> Though he turns around and makes Peggy just as sick as he is for not telling the truth in the first place. Hank attempts to confront the CEO himself, but is both lied to and rebuffed. So, remember in my top 10 worst episode list, I mentioned that Peggy can do badass things from time to time? Well, this is one of them. Peggy initially wanted to tell the customers about the beer being tainted, but was told that the PR team was handling the recall announcement. But when it becomes evident that they intend to do nothing, she decides to take matters into her own hands and decides to take down the system and hold them accountable by giving the board members the bad beer as well. Amazingly, she succeeds in doing so, and in an impressive display of humility, especially for Peggy, she doesn't even tell Hank that the actual recall announcement was her doing, and allows Hank to believe it was because of him. Very good, Peggy. If only you could keep at it. Number 6 Nine Pretty Darn Angry Men It's Thanksgiving at the Hill household, and Cotton, ignoring the holiday rotation, intrudes on Hank's mother's visit by insulting her all throughout dinner, while Hank does nothing. The next day, while everyone is shopping, the gang and Cotton, and Con, participate in a focus group for a new lawnmower model. Everyone is immediately enamored by the sleek design with extra features, but Hank immediately determines that there's little practicality in all of the add-ons. Hank decides he will put his money where his mouth is and becomes the one voice of dissent among the participants and gradually starts to wear them down until they see his point of view. Okay, so there are a lot of 12 Angry Men parody slash homages out there. Hey Arnold did one, The Simpsons did one, Malcolm in the Middle did one, the list goes on. And they're all great, this one being no exception. Hank is pretty set in his ways when it comes to a lot of things, but in this case here, he's able to defend his stance and back up his reasoning. In fact, a lot of obvious character flaws are brought up in this episode. Bill always relying on Hank's opinion, Hank's issues with his father and inability to stand up for his mother. You defended Troy Aikman more than you defended your mother. And even the side characters as well. That's a men's loafer. It is a uni loafer. You, sir. Uh, Elaine Pratley. I own Pratley Ford, Pratley Hyundai, and uh, got my eye on Pratley Cadillac. My daddy ain't doing so good. You confuse personal issues with technological. I have father issues too, but this is a good more. Yeah. Mm. But what I like most about this episode is how Hank stands up to his father, something that is long overdue. This isn't the first time someone's told Cotton to lay off his ex-wife, but Hank usually was one to take a more passive approach. But here, he actually lays down an ultimatum, which is made a hundred times better that his mother was able to see it. I've had enough, Dad. Don't you talk to me like that, boy. I'll tell you when you've had enough. No, Dad. My mower is not too old, and my mom was not too old. But this isn't about my mom, and it's certainly not about my mower. It's about a bitter old man who blames everybody but himself for all his own problems. And if you ever talk about my mom or my mower like that again, you're not welcome in my house. Amen. <laughs> I like this episode because Hank gets a chance to show he's not just some old guy set in his ways and that his criticisms usually come from a place of experience. Though I don't know why Boomhauer didn't bring up the fact that the new lawnmower had a cup holder when Hank says the seat warmer would also warm his beer. Also, they just leave Peggy at the mall at the end. Get wrecked, Peggy. Number 5 Hank in the Glass Elevator the gang celebrates Bill's birthday and go to Austin for a fun weekend. There, it becomes evident that Hank's stick-in-the-mud attitude doesn't mesh with the guy's carefree ones, and he finds himself alone for most of the trip. 
Deciding it's okay to let loose once in a while, Hank decides to join the guys in mooning the hotel guests in their glass elevator, including the former governor of Texas, Ann Richards, to which it turns out the guys tricked him into doing it himself. Bill takes the fall for Hank and apologizes to Governor Richards, and the two strike up a relationship. Things are going well for Bill, but the reemergence of his ex-wife complicates matters, and Bill finds himself juggling the two women. I really like episodes that give Bill a win every once in a while. Bill is very happy while dating Ann Richards, and he doesn't act like his creepy self anymore. And bonus points that Ann Richards actually voiced herself in this episode. I'll tell you a little secret, Bill. I had a teacher once that served during World War II, and he mooned Eleanor Roosevelt. The sad thing, of course, is that Bill decides for old habits and engages with his ex-wife while dating someone else, which is a disappointment. Even Hank tells him Lenore only came back because she saw how well he was doing. Heck, even Lenore admits this. Showing up in the society pages with the governor on your arm. So it's a smidge annoying that Bill allows a good thing to get away, even when his friends remind him of this. But in the very least, the breakup with Ann Richards doesn't leave Bill mopey, and she shows him a good deal of respect despite everything. She even inspires him to stand up to his ex-wife and kick her out of his life once and for all, too. Ann, would you excuse me for a moment? <laughs> this episode also has one of the funniest subplots ever involving Peggy and Bobby realizing how much better charcoal is than propane. You brought charcoal into our house. I didn't know what it was. Luann asked me to hold it for her. I thought it was drugs. There's soot under my boy's nails. You don't get that from a clean burning fuel. You don't get the rich smoky flavor either. I'm in agreement with Bobby on that one. Charcoal tastes better and it's much less of a hassle to maintain. Sorry, Hank. And what a dick move giving that ultimatum to Peggy. I want you to choose, Peggy, right now. Which is better? Charcoal or me? So it's assumed that Peggy and Bobby bite the bullet and eat the less delicious steak, and Hank goes on believing the lie. Good job, Hank. Number four. Oh yeah! Buck Strickland hires some new eye candy, Tammy, at Hank's work, and Peggy befriends her. She finds out that she has no place to stay and graciously gives her a temporary home with the Hills, even offering to help her study to get her GED. Hank is apprehensive at first, but warms up to her when she is able to pay rent on time and becomes good friends with Peggy. Soon, however, it becomes apparent that she has a side prostitution hustle that culminates in her pimp coming to town to confront Hank. There's a lot to unpack in this episode. For a one-off character, Tammy is extremely likable, and it's nice to see Peggy interact with other women besides Nancy and Min, and she seems to bring out the best in her. Hank, too, enjoys having her around and sports that stylish pimp hat she gifts him. It's hilarious how long it takes Peggy and Hank to figure out what Tammy's really doing. Bad enough I have to live with her now, running around the house in those mini skirts. That pager never stops beeping, and I've had it up to here with her coming in all hours of the night. If the makeover and hat aren't enough, it doesn't even occur to them she may be off meeting Johns throughout the day. But the real icing on the cake is the fact that Hank was technically a pimp for a brief time. He sets up meetings, he shakes down the Johns if they cause trouble, and he drives into Cadillac to boot. Strangely enough, this episode brings out the best of these characters. Peggy takes a genuine interest in helping someone down on their luck. Tammy gives Peggy a makeover and is appreciative of the Hills for helping her out. And Hank, good ol' Hank, look at what this man does to help out. I am the Mac Daddy of Heimlich County. I play it straight up, yo. You get the hell out of my hood. She's my hoe now. You'd think someone like Hank would just take this matter to the police or his boss, but nope. He takes matters into his own hands and tells her pimp to get lost, not caring that he's going to be seen as a pimp probably forever. Good for you, Hank. And Snoop Dogg playing a skinny white pimp? The hysterics are abound. Man, don't be giving me no nut roll. Number three, The Exterminator. So a bit of a backstory on this one. In a time before COVID, the before time, People used to perform these mundane, tedious jobs in office buildings where we sit in a cubicle all day. Now most of us office workers work from home, where we sit in front of a computer all day, but in our pajamas. 
Dale is rendered unconscious during a routine extermination gig and is told that if he doesn't quit, he will die an early death. He stops working and spends his days doing pretty much nothing until Nancy asks Hank to help him find work. Hank sets him up with an office job where he works from 9 to 5 and finds the environment stifling. It isn't until he is offered a huge promotion and the opportunity to fire a bunch of people, given his penchant for not feeling empathy, that he starts to delight in the work, much to the chagrin of those close to him. And they'll Up think yours, Joseph! Dale! Guy you fired today, the way he was crying. I, said, sh -sh 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 I just can't get that image out of my head. This was an episode that I enjoyed a lot as a kid because it was funny watching Dale go around firing people. Mr. Gribble, how would you like to make this your permanent job? Firing Gladstone? Sure. Gladstone! Uh. No, no. <laughs> but came to love it immensely as an adult. After I got my office job, I understood exactly what Dale was going through. That's the coffee talking, and the fluorescent lighting, and the excruciating headache. Anybody that has worked a regular 9 to 5 in a corporate setting, myself included, it knows exactly what he's talking about. The set times for lunches, the casual Fridays, the fluorescent lighting, and the clicking and typing. Oh gosh, the clicking and typing. You also get to see just how much it can quickly grate on someone. Why don't you just take off her antennas? Why don't you just take off Bobby's head? Dale was the perfect character to put in this situation because he's so not the type of person that would do well in a setting where he's surrounded by people. Yet he somehow manages to go further than any one of his friends would because of his apathy. Mike Judge worked in Silicon Valley in the late 1980s and was critical of the corporate culture out there. Having lived in Silicon Valley for about four years, I can definitely see where he's coming from. This is probably the only episode in the entire series where Dale is without his trademark sunglasses and hat for almost the entire episode, showing you how much corporate jobs can strip away your humanity. And bonus points to Dale for leaving the job at the top of his game, because he isn't even in it for the money. And even moreover, you get to see Dale being badass even in a corporate setting. Now that's pretty awesome. Definitely the best Dale episode. Don't worry, we'll get to the other ones later. Number two, keeping up with our Joneses. Okay, come on now, we all just call this the cigarette episode. Bobby and Joseph try their hand at smoking and get caught by Hank. Hank, being the genius that he is, thinks it's a fitting punishment to force Bobby to smoke an entire carton in one sitting. Surprisingly, this has the opposite effect, and the entire family winds up addicted to cigarettes. Bobby, because he smoked most of the carton, and Hank and Peggy, because of their previous bonding time smoking. They try to keep it a secret from each other until eventually it all comes to light. The family tries various methods to curb the behavior while Luann offers encouragement. One of the more intense episodes from the first season, this episode did a good job depicting an internal family struggle. While much of the King of the Hill series has a mundane family reacting to fantastical external forces, this episode focuses on just the family and what struggles it can go through behind closed doors, which the episode's name references too well. Addictions, especially shared addictions, can tear a family apart, and it's a difficult thing to depict humorously. Thankfully, this episode contains several funny moments to lighten the mood without necessarily downgrading the impact an addiction can have. Bobby, the patch goes on your shoulder. Bobby! Bobby! Bobby, spit it out! Spit it out! Hank, you hold him. I'll go get a stick. And there are also some good lines about leading by example in regards to quitting. How can we expect Bobby to quit when we won't? We're the adults. We have to set an example. Hey, that's my rough. I also really like how Luann is portrayed in this episode. Luann is compassionate by nature, but much of it seems to come from her naivete. Here, she's acutely aware of what Vice did to her own family, and she takes an active role in trying to keep the hills from falling down the same path, even resorting to tough love. Unlock this door right now. I'm crating y'all in like an unruly dog. I'm sick of dysfunctional families. I came from one, and I'm not going to let it happen to you. Function! Function, damn you! 
And it seems to work because the family decides to hunker down and get through their addiction together. Oh, Hank. I know. Isn't it the most beautiful day you've ever seen? I actually really like this ending. Despite having a severe thunderstorm tearing up the neighborhood, Hank sees the next day is beautiful because they were all able to survive this trial together and live to see another day. I don't know if the writers intended for it to be this deep, but there you have it. And of course, before number one, I will be listing out a few honorable mentions. And again, thank you so much for watching. Return to La Grunta. As mentioned in the subtle brilliance of King of the Hill, this is probably my favorite episode, but I've already spoken about this episode at length in its own video, so I decided to not have it take up a slot for this list. This list was already difficult enough for me to narrow down, so I decided to just have it listed as an honorable mention here. A Firefighting We Will Go, a classic episode that brings the slapstick humor in full force. It's funny to think about. The guys aren't usually subjected to being around just each other in a living situation and how incompatible they'd be as roommates. This episode has some of the funniest moments in the series, too. Dogdale Afternoon and Soldier of Misfortune. Two Dale-centric episodes that perfectly encapsulate Dale as a character. The former showing how damaging his paranoia can truly be, especially when someone is actively fostering it, and the latter showing that, despite all his crazy antics, Dale knows how to fool someone he knows well and is able to get away with it. Oh, and Gary Busey plays an insane gun fanatic that likes to bake stuff. Win-win. Tanking it to the streets. Another Bill-centric episode that reveals a little bit more of his backstory to further exemplify his fall from grace. In this episode, when Bill believes all his shortcomings weren't his fault, he grows more confidence and it has good results, until he finds out it was all his fault. The end of the episode shows him taking more strides to improve himself, yet this growth seems to be forgotten in later episodes. Raise the stakes. I love that this episode shows that someone like Hank can find common ground with a bunch of hippies by bonding over good food and understanding what it takes to get it. I love how his insight in running a business helps the co-op grow, and their empathetic approach to nature allows him to appreciate how it affects the food he eats. Then, of course, they sell out when offered enough money. Pretty good commentary. And the number one King of the Hill episode is... Returning Japanese, or more specifically, Returning Japanese Part 2. I actually saw Part 2 when it first aired before I saw Part 1, so I previously didn't know how the hills made it to Japan, but I didn't mind, because there is a lot going on in the second part. Peggy is able to secure a trip to Japan for the family with the intent to write an article about Cotton returning to confront the women whose husband Cotton supposedly killed during World War II. However, it becomes evident that that's not the case, and Cotton actually had a romantic relationship with this woman, resulting in the birth of a son, Junichiro, voiced by the late David Carradine. Hank makes strides to connect with his half-brother, but Junichiro bluntly tells Cotton that what he did to his mother was unforgivable and wants nothing to do with his American family, to which Cotton responds by redeclaring war on Japan and going on a rampage. A popular entry as the number one best King of the Hill episode, this episode has it all. It has heart, it has a good plot, and it actually humanizes one of the most abrasive characters in the show. Cotton is obviously hurt that his own son wants nothing to do with him, but it's for a good reason. Cotton didn't make any strides on his own to contact Michiko after he left, though to be fair he may not have known she was pregnant. You can tell Cotton truly did care for Michiko and did not want to leave her. Hank and Junichiro also slowly begin to bond while searching for their father, and there is some humorous culture clash. What is wrong with these people? Why won't they talk to me? What do you expect? Running around like crazy cowboy? It's not Texas. Shoot off guns, pow, 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 Rambo, John Wayne. He's say have to get in there. What the? You already did that. He sent you to the other guy. Japan can sometimes be tiresome in this way. <laughs> I kick your ass! Look at me! Here come Ronald Reagan and Mike Tyson! 
They also bond over their shared genetic shortcomings and love of beer. There's a great side plot involving Bobby and a local Japanese girl, too, bonding over a dancing video game. And another one of Luann mixing up Ladybird with another dog because she thinks she died. And even another one of Bill and Dale living in Hank's house. They don't really go anywhere as far as the main plot is concerned, but they are pretty funny. I really enjoy the way they depict Junichiro accepting Cotton as his true father. Father, no! What did you just call me? I called you father. There is no shame in being a hill. Hank taught me that, and he also taught me there is no shame in having a narrow urethra. Uh, that was just between brothers. Ah, like Japan, I am no longer your enemy. And like my little brother, I am your son, I tell you what. And Cotton finally pronounces his name correctly, showing he has more respect for his Japanese culture as well. The departure of Cotton from Michiko was also very touching. It's a darn shame about that nice hotel room, though. I also hear from fans that this would have been a perfect way to end the series, but I'm glad it continued on. Personally, I do prefer the series ending where Bobby and Hank bond over steak and grilling more than this one because a large theme of the show showed how different Hank and Bobby were, but this episode served as a perfect season finale. Well, there you have it. Those are my top 10 favorite King of the Hill episodes in no particular order. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Harvey McLeod, and I'm here to make videos for you, and I will see y'all next time. Bye-bye!